Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Um, A of another language. I speak not as an authority, but a perpetual learner, and right now a speaker at Typographics 2022. My sincerest gratitude to all of you who um, gave me this chance and to all of you who came here to listen to me. I want to start by acknowledging the ancestral and unceded lands of the Lenape nations on which I learn, make, and design today. Renewing, recalling, reactivating the oral tradition, a lineage of whisperers, suggestions, soft utterances, and outright rumors. I also want to take this chance to thank my dear comrades, Silas Chen, Tiger Dingson, and my younger brother, Rameshwar, who's here with me today in the audience. A part of me really likes to believe in the idea of design, and another part of me really doesn't. A third part of me considers both of these positions wrong. I kept returning to the same few ideas. In my mind and on the page, I was looping the circumference of a nasty fixed diameter circle. I feel like recursion is how we construct reality. By that, I mean we create versions after versions, surface and surface, meaning on meaning, division after division, ad infinitum. Here you see all the portfolios I've had to create and send out to people in the last three years. I was told that I used to draw even before I learned how to speak. I recently learned of this example where before a child knows how to say rock, it picks it up because it, fit, it fits neatly into its palm. The same could be true with a drawing tool. It's beautiful and poetic to think about how the immediate physicality of making marks can supersede the ability and urge of meaning making and classification of forms and sound. I drew all over my grandmother's walls with my cousins, overlapping wild animals, forests, jungles, strange figures, and scribbled creatures tangled all across her bedroom, all playing under the light of a huge yellow sun. And between the occasion of my early drawings and of my early drawings on my grandmother's walls and what I make and do today, a lot of stuff happened. I studied graphic design because it felt the most versatile of all disciplines. And design education taught me visual thinking, systematization methods that were broad enough to apply to many forms. But as useful as design education was, I also found it boring and cruel at some times. I was uninterested in establishing orderly systems and visuals. Something felt quite anal and fascistic in this pursuit to attain ideal purity. I returned to drawing again four years ago after graduating. I had just begun to think about the metaphor of edges, which led me to play around with the sharpen edge command in Photoshop. I would find existing images and then shift command F, shift command fuck them 10,000 times. When the Brooklyn-based Resograft Collective textbooks first approached me to make a zine of my choice, I found myself wanting to draw for myself to make my own pixels, to make drawings that were not an aid or subservient to anything else. I want to think about inner archaeology, inner language, inner topography. Could I then conduct an inner excavation? I like the metaphor of excavation because it denotes layers, narrative layers, psychic layers, risograph layers, and even Photoshop layers. Usually, forms I make are a compound of experiences I've had and other forms that I've seen before. A lot of work I do lives in this amorphous area between figurative illustration and abstract sign. I try to work towards drastically altering our contact with our tools, re-encountering objects, bodies, and language as a strange thing, making odd, overlaid, and twisted forms, using tools for synthesis rather than purely arrangement or editing. I want to write with this writing rather than about it, think about it as a remix. I often arrived in this wild world meticulously one pixel at a time, drinking concerning amounts of iced coffee and listening to loud electronic music on repeat. I either go pixel by pixel, like here, 
or I relinquish all agency and let a scene of generative, unexpected consequence of imperfection emerge out of the image that I want to create. I find it fascinating and unbelievable how the hieroglyph bull becomes an A, and perhaps it may crack the vessel it is contained within one day and burst out into its animal form again. Uniformity bores me. In typography, I'm really drawn to the psychotic, the chaotic, the neurotic, the A of animality. I'm so excited when figuration and abstraction are embedded in each other when it comes to typography. Most people think the letter A is just a shape, but drawn shapes often deviate from the norm, stretching the flexible part ideas in very interesting ways. The computer scientist Douglas Hofstadter refers to an idea called letter spirit, which has been to address two important aspects of letter forms. The conceptual sameness possessed by letters belonging to a given category, for example, A's, and the stylistic sameness possessed by letters belonging to a given style, for example, Helvetica. I find it useful to toy with this line between legible and, and the illegible, the A in all our minds. The act of writing A is not a single witnessable act, but an array of the possible A's that exist in our mental domains, a multitude of A's, an A-shaped cloud that constitutes all A's before they become legible. How much flourish then can language afford before it starts to look totally unknown? The way you say A or the way I say A, the way we say syllables sounds essentially the same but the moisture and the reverb of our distinct voices gives the sound a variety of possible tones. I feel like letter spirit brings this notion into the visual realm. The intangible essence of what A-ness appears to be, irregardless of how it may be visualized, we feel familiar with the spirit that works behind these technical bindings of a form. Considering letter spirit makes the object of typography an actor and an agent, not just a ground or a surface to work on. I love subdivision and morphing the alphabet, the action that's inherent in subdivision and subconjunction. I like to mess with the formal root of the glyph, glyphal cross-pollination, perhaps, to see if characters from one script can start behaving like an alternate system altogether. Spicing the letters beyond recognition, change beyond generation, like amoebas exchanging information just before they die? What if the letter spirit were placed on steroids, hormones, changing at the cellular level? What is the most intense gesture these typographic structures can sustain? I aspire towards splitting, complicating, heightening, and fragmenting the letter spirit. Playing with the abstract concept pushes our work into the gaps that exist between meaning and feeling. A bit of rewilding. Language that starts to pulsate, mutate, the, at, towards the doorstep of total chaos. From Latin, non-Latin, to beyond. Ma, mrugjerno ma. How much more typographic perfume can I inject before the anatomy of a letter begins to corrode? When the mental concepts of a glyph and an image start to feel disorientingly useless. If letters have spirits, then do we invoke them? Is our work as typographers a form of incantation across visions, glyphs, and interfaces? We manipulate the flow between abstract and literal, creating and mapping a labyrinth of twisting alphabets ambiguous pathways, traversal trails, tight alleys, and even rivers that flow in two directions at once. Not to senselessly mythologize the discipline, but to place us in a larger field of cosmic and earthly makers and thinkers, to de-studio, de-brand, de-clout, de-commodify, de-fetishize the sense of our word practice, the purpose of this mythic register is to bring close the distant past to our own small lives. For the manifold dead and extant fields of designs, or whatever it was before adopted this wretched name, for everything to be as beautiful and painful now as the smooth Bézier curve, the most current bloodless manifestation of what we can do. 
Designers and typographers are couriers and housekeepers for ideas that steward our cultures, deconstructing and tidying visions and voices drawn from the bowels of the vast abstract. Art director as a perverse master chanter who knows how to organize the relations between forms and meanings. Does the master chanter sing to the whales, the job market, the bird, the feed, the atmosphere? How are its ceremonies structured? What does it mean to sing, to chant, or to display? Stop. What am I really saying? Design an ambient belief. A rebus made of unknown letters that were vomited into the gutters, warped by the sun, crushed and bastardized, having become and made into refuse, here also another suggestion. Design always containing the mutually incompatible, representing the duality of things, the echo, the symmetry, the good and the evil, simultaneity of time, the plus minus, the yes but, the yes and, the ha ha as well, or recto verso, the opposition between the voice and the writing, a rabbit hole with a caption. Design is a waste treatment plant of the spectacle. It's a mechanism that catalogs all our human desires, a theorem incomplete. Uh-oh. Design is pheromonal. You can smell design. It's a bit of a pissing contest. Design is a stigmatism stuck with you forever. Design is a moment where the embroiderer licks the thread before threading the wet tip in the eye of a needle. I can be a good maker, but a bad worker. Labor is entitled to all, it's, all it creates. I want to speak of two instances of my work in depth. The musician, songwriter, and Bollywood music director Ankur Tiwari reached out to me last year to work on his upcoming album, Akela, which means alone. This project has not yet been released, but I'm very excited to give you all a first glimpse today. I was very inspired by the notation on Ankur's harmonium, the seven handwritten notes taped to the keys. The album was written and produced during the pandemic in times of isolation, hence the title Akela. Ankur and I were very excited to try something with portraiture, to play with masking elements, forms becoming a barrier, how we all became a different, distanced version of ourselves, masked physically and masking our insides, filters and barriers within and without, we were keen to try typography and marks that masked the face, disrupting the vision, creating noise, letters that became a curtain. My starting point was Ankur's handwriting. How he handwrote all the song lyrics as he composed them felt so intimate and beautiful. I wanted to fulfill this deep urge to see Devnagri script in a pulsating, fluid, chaotic form, throbbing with stylization and flair. But from the beginning, I felt really unhappy with all the iterations I produced. I felt smothered by the sense that there was something missing. When I feel hindered by literal type, I turn to its abstraction. I redrew the Devnagri letters of Akela in an abstracted set of ornamental glyphs, microforms and blips that helped me add wildness to this mix. I started by using the Shirorekha, a key anatomical part of the Devnagari script, the line from which all characters hang. It's used to slash Ankur's face in half. Draft, another draft, and another draft, another draft after another draft, another draft and another. The end cover is shot by the photographer Prasna Singh, with Ankur sitting behind a physical veil. Looking away, I merged the ornaments and typography and framed his portrait in them, growing like sinuous flourishes, 
and curtaining his seated torso, layered and diaphanous. The type and the drawings integrate. The blips and ornaments carry on to the rest of the vinyl packaging, as seen here. Here I use the blips and ornaments to expand the system further into a single, in the single artworks. I also use the Devnagri A uh and B to twirl into the two vinyl labels. And here, a version that includes both Devnagri and Latin glyphs elongated into a draping fissure. Again, the ornaments, the chainmail of glyphs, the curtain. I now want to share the extensive and intimate process of collaborating with the artist and musician Nicholas Jar on his sixth studio album, Telas. I must have listened to at least three very different versions of the album. The design also went through comparably drastic changes. The earlier work looks almost like the parent to the child, profoundly similar yet profoundly different. Nicholas never gave me a brief per se, even though a part of me desperately wanted that kind of orientation. What's not apparent in the final product is the richness of the iterations. We worked on it together for over two years. Nico encouraged an abundant belief in our own intuition. He welcomed all intensities of feeling, which became a way to make creative decisions, not to envision an end goal, but to commit fully to a process. It's a, such a foreign sensation. The project for Telas ended up being three things, the album artwork, a website, and the music. These things are interconnected since they came into being alongside one another, and their relationship is almost like that of a sibling. They're messy, entangled, and very unpredictable. Nicholas had told me an anecdote where when he was composing Telas, he had moved to a new home in an old room where he found spider webs in every corner. It was enchanting to see how these structures defined an empty space, despite how delicate they were. He had meant to call the album Telarañas, spider webs. A central motif, spinning, a defined center and focus, but in its inwardness, it ends up looking out. Since the album visuals would be the first thing most people saw, the process required a sort of vast precision that required many different iterations in the lead up to the final image. The first gesture of this project was to letter the title. But many, 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 many revisions and name changes later, I was no longer even thinking typographically anymore. I had been subtracting forms and erasing pixels. And suddenly, Nico saw the word telas in the composition, and it all kind of clicked. So in fact, what we chose was totally unintentional, a mistake, an instance of pure chance. Only by destroying, only by destroying the album a tiny bit, 1,000 times, could we have arrived at the most appropriate conclusion. Part of me simply doesn't know what would best suit an audio piece that was itself a cycle of expansion on a central motif. The built, broken, shifted progression towards the most maximal buildup, followed by a gradual tearing down layer after layer until it re-solidified into something fundamental, but also fundamentally different from we had begun with. And here's the entire album artwork tattooed on flesh of a Parisian fan of Nicholas's. To ends and beginnings, I conclude my talk by proposing graphic design as just one structure out of many possible structures. Not a grand synthesis or a master plan, but more similar to bees gathering pollen to make honey or the hairs of a massive root like creeping slowly, taking human generations to traverse a vast terrain, forming a lattice, a network of tiny, hungry threads, wandering and intimately collecting across seasons and sources to create sustenance. This is how I aspire to channel ideas, 
They meander and intertwist, seemingly unrelated, and come from all sorts of gatherings. Every idea is excavated from a midden, a pile that's allowed to fester into perfect mulch, hot and steaming for the spores of a different animal. Consider everything I make a worthy experiment. Thank you.